Hi, everybody. How's it going? Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Kira Russell. I'm studying psychology and visual arts. And today I'm going to be talking to you about my keystone, which studies art therapy and emotion language skill development for borderline personality disorder. Um, and I'm here with my fantastic supervisor, Dr. Shannon Sauerzavala from the Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders. But before I jump into my keystone, I wanted to ask you guys, who here is having a bad day? You can be honest with me. I'll keep it a secret. <laughs> yeah? We all have them. It's a good symposium day. It's positive. But sometimes everyone has some bad days. You might be feeling anxious about your symposium presentation. You might be feeling bored because you've already listened to 10 symposium presentations. <laughs> but you could be feeling an array of negative emotions. And a term like bad doesn't really pinpoint how you're exactly experiencing the day. In my field of research, we actually consider this term an umbrella term, which means that it doesn't necessarily target the specific negative emotions that might be associated with what's, what you're experiencing. Another word that we use is emotional granularity, which talks about how specific are the words that you use to describe your emotions. And we can think of emotional granularity like sand. So if you have a high granularity, you have lots of different sand particles, lots of emotion words, and that's great. You're effectively emotion emotionally labeling your experience. However, if you have a low granularity and you're on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're not using a lot of emotion words. And in fact, if you reach too low, you may have alexithymia, which is the clinical marker of low emotion language or emotional granularity skills. So in my past three years here, I've been studying the intersection of borderline personality disorder and emotion language or emotional granularity. And through my research, I've found that people with BPD in particular face a deficit in emotion language skill development. But first, what are we looking at at BPD? I put these on the board so you can see that borderline personality disorder is a debilitating disorder across many different areas of functioning. Cognitively, interpersonal functioning, behavioral, these are just a list of the symptoms that we use to diagnose borderline personality disorder. But at the core, all of these symptoms are tied by emotion dysregulation, which is essentially the processing and understanding of our emotions and lack or the inability to do so. So if emotion dysregulation is at the core of borderline personality disorder, we can actually frame BPD as an emotional disorder, similar to anxiety or depression. And if we see that emotional disorder or emotion dysregulation is the key part of BPD, then emotional labeling or emotion language would thus be key in sort of the processing or attacking of any of these different symptoms. So if I identified this issue, what are the current treatments that we're using to try to target these problems? The two frontline treatments for BPD currently are cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy. And in short, DBT and CBT identify negative cognitions associated with our emotions and provide adaptive solutions to cope with these emotions. However, there are a couple limitations to these frontline treatments. Treatment protocol for DBT and CBT does not specifically target the emotion language deficits in borderline personality disorder. In fact, these treatment protocols actually assume that participants or patients coming into treatment may already have an understanding of how to express their emotions. But if they don't have this emotion language skill, then we can't really get inv invested in treatment. So I saw this expressive gap in treatment, and naturally, as a visual artist, I saw that painting and visual arts may be a way to address this expressive gap. That led me to my key research question, which is how does a brief art therapy intervention affect emotion language skill and expression in borderline personality disorder? So investigating this question, the first method I used was trying to seek out experts in the field. And this is Melissa Walker. She's one example of a semi-famous psychologist. Um, she gave the TED Med 2015 Keystone talk on her work with art therapy for a PTSD population with the Department of Defense in DC. And I was totally infatuated by her work, so I emailed her, tried to connect with her on LinkedIn, sent her a Twitter DM, and a couple months later, she finally got back to me with actually some really great resources on how I could potentially attack this question. And so these were the methods that I started to use. First, we recruited using the SONA platform, which BU has an online database of different participants in the Psych 101 class that wants, wants to participate in different studies. Um, and although lots of people responded to the SONA, study. Um, they first had to complete a PI BOR screening, which is the personality assessment inventory for the borderline subscale, which essentially means that they had to meet a minimum level of borderline personality disorder in order to be accepted into the study. And if they qualified, they were then randomized to either the control condition or the experimental condition. 
what's these conditions look like? So the control condition was 30 minutes of coloring mandalas. This is based off of 2005 Curry and Casser research, which shows that coloring mandalas may increase mindfulness or maybe make you more aware of your emotional state, but doesn't necessarily engage in the emotional processing that's necessary in addressing the emotion language deficits in BPD. On the experimental side, I used Melissa Walker's research to inspire this emotional portrait painting. And this is a great example of an emotional portrait painting. Um, so I actually came up with a, a script, this intervention that has three step process. First, I had participants identify an emotional color palette. So I prompted them with different negative emotions, be it anger, sadness, guilt, anxiety, and they would have to mix and identify colors that they would associate with that emotion. They would then break an emotional event into three key parts, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And they would use different textures, shapes, or symbols to describe these different components. And then eventually at the end, they would combine both the colors that they created and the different components that they developed to create one emotional event portrait, which was an abstract representation of an emotional event that they had experienced. So how do we measure to see if there were any differences amongst these two conditions? First, we had quantitative measures of alexithymia, which I mentioned before is the clinical deficit in emotion language skill, mood awareness and emotional intensity that are also associated with emotion language, and more importantly, we had a qualitative measure of emotional granularity called a mood induction. And what happens in a mood induction is we have participants write for 10 minutes about a recent emotional experience that they had, um, and this sort of induces that negative state or that emotion that they were experiencing. They would then complete the art activity and follow by the same quantitative and qualitative measures to see if we could get any change on any of these variables. And sort of what we found is that quantitatively, there is a clinical motion language deficit, which supports my three years of research, thank goodness. 41.7% um, of participants actually met criteria for alexithymia. And to put that number in perspective, the general population is maybe at 7 to 10%, and a clinical population of anxiety and depression ranges from about 25% to 35 so this is extra presented in borderline personality disorder, which just reemphasizes the need to address this emotion language deficit in treatment. However, on our variables of emotional intensity and emotional awareness, we did not find any significant changes in either condition. And one reason that this may be a null finding is that it may take multiple sessions or different treatment to sort of manipulate these variables rather than a single session of art therapy. Qualitatively, I use NVivo coding, which I know many of us have talked about today. Um, it's a nice qualitative coding me uh, measure that you can sort of input those mood inductions that I was talking about earlier and qualitatively code for the amount of motion words or the way that people were describing their emotions. So you can see sort of an example of what the screen would look like there. And luckily, we actually found that there was indeed an increased use and variety of emotion words in the experimental condition, but not in the control condition. So this means that as they were engaging in that emotional portrait painting, they were actually getting higher labeling skills and higher emotional granularity to put into that mood induction. And to sort of put that in real terms, this is an example of a mood induction from one of the participants. The first mood induction before the art activity, I was overwhelmed with emotion. I didn't know how to describe how I was feeling because I was not sure. But then after the painting activity, Having my partner reach out at a time when my life was chaotic and stressful was difficult because I was preoccupied with other problems. Here, the event doesn't change. It's still confusing and overwhelming, lots of emotions, um, but now she has sort of these labels or these tools to effectively describe her experience. So in total, some of the conclusions we gathered, um, as the alexithymia scores reported, there is low emotion language skills in which is characteristic borderline personality disorder. Um, quantitatively, we did not find that mood awareness nor emotional intensity would be changed in a single session of art therapy. However, there is qualitative support that there is some increased emotional granularity with guided art therapy. And what's exciting about these findings is that hopefully we can use this sort of treatment with more quantitative support and through a larger sample size um, to essentially supplement pre-existing successful cognitive behavioral and dialectical behavioral therapies. Um, and I'm very hopeful that although participants may be having anxious, sad, frustrated days, they may be having less bad days and they're being able to get those words to label their experience more effectively. So thank you. Any questions? Have you explained?
explored um, alternate theoretical models like the original psychoanalytic work on borderline personality done by Otto um, Kernberg and Heinz Kohut as a kind of contrast to the CBT model? Yeah, I think that's honestly an excellent question and great approach. Um, I think one thing that's kind of difficult, at least about sort of, I think our educational approach here at BU and some of the models that we're used to is that it's very CBT focused. Um, but I think definitely, especially in the art therapy context, there is a lot of psychoanalytic, um, I guess, harmony sort of with that field. And so it's definitely something that I have investigated. I will say in development of this project, I was mainly focused on the CBT models that have been proven to be most uh, have the most evidential support for being effective treatments. Um, but I would definitely be interested in looking into more of those psychoanalytic models to see how that would complement this. Thanks, really yeah. good project. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Kathleen. Um, were people receptive of art as a form of therapy or did you find that participants really weren't aware that this could be um, an option? Yeah, great question. Um, I'd say that overall the response was pretty positive. There's definitely some hesitance. I think um, I sort of have this debrief before they start their art activity that I will not judge them on any of the work that they produce and that you don't have to be an art expert and that all of your paintings will just be sort of away, <laughs> labeled like anonymously. And so I think once they have that sort of precedent for that it's a non-judgmental activity, they feel much more um, willing to approach the matter and sort of buy in. And I think ha letting them take the creative reins and just providing support and encouragement has been really successful in getting people on board. Yeah, Divya? Um, in terms of the scope of the population that this will affect, um, what are the numbers for like, BPD in the general population? That's a great question. So it kind of differs depending on what population we have. For example, in the college student population, it's potentially more pronounced with emotional disorders. But there are some predictions around eight to 10%, and it sort of ranges within the comorbidity, because BPD is typically very comorbid with other emotional disorders. So that can kind of contribute to misdiagnoses or potential uh, other factors are involved. So there's definitely a range of, of prevalence scores, but yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>